Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, well, thank you uh, to the organizer for putting together this uh, nice uh, series of talks with speakers from uh, um, all over, over the world, as far as I can tell, and both uh, foreigners and Russians. So it's a great pleasure to, to address you um, today. So I, I want to, uh, to do a, a review of uh, SpinEyes to try to inform you of uh, what this field is about. And um, so I won't get into very technical details such that uh, if you are interested, you can, uh, you can look for yourself in the in most rec more recent reviews. Um, so let me uh, first tell you where Waterloo is to position you. We were just talking about time zones. So uh, this is a, on the top left here is a map of North America. And uh, the, the red star here indicates where Waterloo is. So it's about 100 kilometers west of Toronto and about 700 kilometers uh, northwest from New York. And uh, so this is a, 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 a smaller view, a more focused view of where Waterloo is. And so um, it's a pretty big campus. Uh, it's about 1,000 acres, uh, 40,000 students, undergrad. There's about 6,000 graduate students, there's six faculties, and it boasts the uh, largest uh, post-secondary cooperative program in the world. So we have every semester 20,000 students that work uh, and do work terms all across the world uh, during their undergrad uh, um, studies. And the university was uh, created in 1959, so it's a relatively uh, uh, young university. Okay. So what I'd like to um, tell you as a general message for my talk is that uh, really two aspects that uh, uh, frustrated uh, quantum magnetism is a very active and exciting uh, field of uh, uh, condensed matter physics and uh, spin ice in particular classical spin ice and now the search for uh, the quantum version of spin ice that we call uh, quantum spin ice is a very, has, has proven to be a very fruitful a platform to learn many aspects of uh, strongly correlated uh, uh, frustrated classical and quantum systems over the last 20 years. And so I think this is what I would like you to try to remember uh, from, from my talk. Um, okay, so, um, so everybody has their own uh, reason for doing the kind of research they do. So uh, let me tell you what mine is. Um, so um, so if, you, uh, if you look at uh, pretty much all graduate textbooks in statistical mechanics and critical phenomena, uh, which are in the section QC 174 in the Lib Library of Congress Classification Scheme. And uh, there's many such books, um, literally hundreds of books. And if you all open them, um, even though those textbooks are about statistical mechanics and phase transitions and general principles, very early on in all these textbooks, the discussion of uh, magnetic systems uh, like the Ising model uh, comes to the fore uh, to try to explain what's the idea of phase transition and critical phenomena. And so my interest in frustrated magnetism and spin ice falls into that kind of uh, mindset. Uh, what do we learn new about uh, collective phenomena and uh, the statistical mechanics of those by considering uh, highly frustrated systems of which uh, spin ice is, is one realization of that. Okay, so, uh, so presumably you all know about the Ising model. I don't want to belabor this point. It's a, it's a classical model of a discrete variable plus or minus one that reside on a lattice. It was invented by Ernst Ising in the 1920s uh, in his uh, PhD thesis. And uh, uh, the, on, a, on a square lattice, on a, the, uh, the ground state, the classical ground state of such uh, uh, system consists of a bipartite lattice where each side is uh, uh, surrounded by uh, a spin that points in the opposite direction. And so here the colors represent the up and down spins of uh, such Ising variables. And so this is referred to as a nail state uh, that was proposed uh, back in the uh, 1940s by uh, Louis Nail, a French physicist who got uh, the Nobel Prize in physics for his work on uh, anti magnetism. Okay, but uh, frustration is, uh, is uh, the situation that arises when you have actually uh, uh, either the interactions compete with each other uh, through um, the, the different components involved between uh, the spin, the spins uh, coupled in, uh, in uh, 
in a competing manner, I will come back to that later, or more or simply, if you have anti four magnetic interactions on, on a lattice where, which is not bipartite. And so, for example, if you consider a, tri a triangular uh, plaquette here, where you have three sides and you have a, a spin on each side, if you have a, an anti four magnetic coupling, uh, these two spins here, uh, Ising spins, for example, can uh, point in opposite direction to minimize the energy of this bond here. Uh, if you then consider uh, this next bond here, then again, these two spins can point anti-parallel, and then you would have the same situation if these two spins here were left uh, on their own and only interacting with this bond here. But the problem arises when actually you consider the, the three spins together, um, and then what you find is that you're not able to minimize the energy of each bond individually, uh, you're not able to minimize energy of the, the entity, the three spins together, by minimizing the energy of each bond uh, pair by pair. And so this is the uh, realization, the simplest realization of what we call a magnetic frustration. It's this inability to uh, uh, minimize the global energy by minimizing each pairwise interaction. Okay, so... Um, um, so for an Ising system, the, the frustration is extreme. Uh, for three spins on a triangular placket, there are six degenerate uh, ground states. Um, but um, very often, uh, uh, the, or most often, in fact, the interactions between uh, spins are not Ising-like or uh, in, um, involving discrete spins that can be pointing on in along two directions, but one has a, a spins uh, at the classical level from a classical perspective that have continuous uh, symmetry. And so, for example, if you relax this uh, Ising constraint and you consider now three classical spins that interact with uh, anti magnetic exchange interaction, the classical minimum energy on a triangular plaquette is where each magnetic moment uh, points uh, 120 degrees uh, from each other. And so, um, now, if you decorate or if you connect all such triangular plaquettes uh, to form a, a, a triangular lattice, then uh, you get, again, a, um, uh, a kind of a long-range ordered state, uh, again, a, a nail ordered state, but instead of having three spins direction, uh, two spins directions that repeat, like uh, up, down, up, down, as in the uh, square lattice, you have a three sub-lattice structure, which here is... Uh, indicated by three colors. And so, um, so a ground state here consists of a three sub lattice when it talks about uh, such lattice as having a square root three by square root three ground state, which is the, the direction in which, or the distance in which uh, spins of the same uh, direction repeat. So for example, moving along uh, the, the direction here, you go from a, a spin pointing uh, color coded by the red direction and, and that pattern repeats. So, um, uh, so even though the triangular lattice is frustrated and uh, uh, the quantum fluctuations of the system with respect to this classical ground state is higher than um, uh, for, the, uh, for a square lattice, uh, it's still uh, long range ordered. And uh, so, um, so frustrated interaction, coming back to the motivation I, uh, I, I stated at the beginning, is, uh, is an ubiquitous uh, notion that arises in condensed matter systems and in many areas of uh, correlated systems in physics. So uh, obviously it arises in magnetism, in uh, molecular crystals, liquid crystals, in the problem of protein folding, uh, superconducting Josephson junctions in a magnetic field, and even the, the, the nuclear, the state, the condensed states of nuclear matter in the neutron stars can be uh, viewed as arising due to a frustration between the neutrons and the protons in neutron stars. So this is the perspective of why I, I like the problem of uh, frustration is because it leads to interesting phenomena in, in a broad range of physical systems. And so the question is, uh, what can we learn that, are, that is general and of broad principle by actually tackling um, uh, specific problems, and spin ice has proven to be one, one of such. Okay, so um, uh, magnetic frustration as a, in itself has a, 
a long history. It goes back to uh, uh, the work uh, of uh, Hutapel in Vanier back in the 1950s, who studied the Ising anti four magnet on the triangular lattice, and subsequent work that I've uh, uh, marked here that spans the 1950s until 1987 or so. Um, <laughs> So even though people were studying non-collinear magnetic uh, systems over those uh, 30 years, um, it was not an extremely active area of research, but the, the modern uh, interest in frustrated mag magnetism really started in 1987. And this is where the story begins. Um, and that led to the discovery of spin ice. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. So I want to talk about the discovery of spin ice. It was an accident um, and explain wh what led to that discovery. Then I want to flesh out uh, some of the essential elements of the physics of spin ice, which um, um, led to 20 years of study. And then mention uh, in point number three, uh, where are we today about experimental and theoretical work in spin ice? and mostly looking at the, the quantum version of these systems. And again, uh, these have been referred to as quantum spin ice. And then I'll conclude. Okay, so uh, uh, I won't uh, get into uh, uh, too many details. If you're interested, there's been a number of reviews on, the, on spin ice going back to pretty much the discovery of these systems. So this is uh, written in 2001 and um, if you really want to get the, uh, the most recent uh, state of affairs uh, about spin ice, there's a book to be uh, published by the Springer series in solid state science that will appear either later this year at the, or at the beginning of 2022. And the whole uh, book is uh, dedicated to the physics of spin ice, both on the uh, experimental and theoretical front has been contributed by various uh, researchers in the field. Um, so what I want to talk about are uh, bulk spin ices, uh, real materials that, are, uh, that exhibit these properties. But there's been in parallel over the last uh, 20 years or so, an effort uh, devoted to what's called artificial spin ice. These are made through lithographic uh, method. Uh, they are two dimensional system and they, they have their own uh, physics of interest uh, dynamical properties and magnetic properties and thermodynamic properties that have also attracted uh, quite a bit of interest. And, and I will not talk about these artificial spin ice or other synthetic versions of spin ice like uh, Rydberg atoms or cold atoms. Uh, if you're interested in that topic, I, I write down a, a review here written by Schieffer, um, uh, uh, Nisoli and Mosner in review of modern physics a few years back. Okay. So, um, so let's begin. So the, uh, the, the interest in frustrated magnetism really started to explode after the discovery of uh, high temperature superconductivity in uh, lanthanum copper, strontium copper oxide, where um, at low doping, there's an anti magnetic uh, state, a nail ordered state, so the copper here uh, form a square lattice. And uh, at most of these uh, cuprates have an anti magnetic ground state uh, at uh, zero or low doping. And uh, the, the, this led to a springboard of investigation in, uh, in magnetism, mostly due to a couple of sentences really um, in the Anderson's paper in 1987, where he uh, suggested that uh, it would be useful to begin uh, or to return to this question of what's the nature of uh, uh, strongly fluctuating quantum uh, magnetic systems, um, which he referred to as a quantum spin liquid and which may exhibit various phases. And that really launched the modern uh, interest in frustrated magnetism where um, people really embark into a whole program in investigating, uh, uh, investigating this, uh, this kind of question. And so he, he, he noticed in the paper that there were two really avenues to, to look for frustrated uh, uh, magnetic interaction and look for exotic physics. One of them is the triangle lattice. But as I mentioned just earlier, uh, it's now there's a consensus that the triangular anti four magnet for spin one half has long range nail out order, a three sub lattice state. But uh, uh, he proposed that there might be other uh, avenues to look for or to discover uh, 
states which were strongly quantum mechanically disordered and lacking long range order. And so let me skip the slide. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, square, the, the triangular lattice has long range magnetic order. There's a broken translational symmetry of the lattice due to the nail ordered phase, the three sub lattice phase. And so the question is how can we consider arch architectures, crystal structures for which the, 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 the long range order is more, much more fragile. And so the, um, so the, the kind of template that people identified early on in the late 1980s, early 1990s, consists of a crystalline structure where the magnetic moments reside on lattices of uh, corner sharing uh, triangles and corner sharing uh, tetrahedra. So the, here are four examples of such systems with their, their name uh, in two dimensions, the, the Kagame lattice, which is a, a, a lattice of corner sharing triangle, uh, is, a, is a lattice which is highly frustrated. Uh, it, it doesn't have classical long range or, order as the, uh, at the classical level as the triangle lattice has. And all these lattices, which are, uh, have different complexity, um, have, uh, have this pattern or this motif of uh, triangles for the hypercagamy or the garnet lattice, uh, where these triangles are only connected by uh, corners or the, the power flow lattice, um, which is a lattice of corner sharing tetrahedra. And this connectivity of triangular uh, units or tetrahedra only by the corners is the, uh, the ingredients that le leads to a very large level of magnetic frustration and a lack of a unique classical ground state. So let me illustrate that for the Kagame lattice, uh, because the idea here that uh, I will uh, illustrate will be very important for spin ice. So if you consider a Kagame uh, lattice of corner shaving tri triangles, and on each side you have a magnetic moment that interacts with an anti-thermagnetic interaction, uh, if you want to minimize the energy on each elementary uh, triangular unit, uh, what you want to do, um, or one way to illustrate the, cl the classical ground state construction, uh, neglecting uh, continuous fluctuations, just the discrete the part of the, the manifold, is you color the lattice. And with a rule, which is a coloring, uh, a coloring rule, which is each side has one of three colors, blue, red, or green, and with the additional rule that no site has a neighbor of the same color. And so, uh, so, when, uh, so when, when can begin doing that? And so, um, so here are the um, uh, emphasizing the, the triangles, uh, de defining this uh, lattice of corner sharing triangles. And so, um, so let's color the lattice. Okay, so the first site, so here I'm gonna color the Kagami lattice with no, um, no uh, boundary conditions, it's open boundaries. And so the first site is arbitrary, so it's chosen to be green. The next one can be blue or red. So every time I go through the slide, I always forget the, the coloring pattern that follows. So the next slide, okay, so it's red. The next one, again, we have two choices. And then we, we can just proceed, color the, color the first row of uh, the Kagami lattice. Now comes the next site. Um, it's, uh, it's arbitrary, it can be uh, blue or red, so it's red. Now, if this was a triangular lattice, there would be a site here uh, that would have to be colored. And so, um, so it can be, uh, it would have to be blue because uh, all the three adjacent sites are red and green. So this site would have to be colored blue. Now you, immediately you notice the problem is the following site on the right hand side of this blue site here cannot be uh, satisfied the rule because I've already exhausted the, the three colors, the blue, red, and green. And so the uh, implication of that is that the coloring that was encoded in the first row was not correct. Uh, it, it, it did not allow to implement the, uh, the, the coloring of the lattice. So, uh, so if you write a program that iterates through that, what you find is that the only way you can color this lattice is with the pattern that I showed earlier, which is the, the repeat, the periodic repeat of three colors. But the Kagami lattice, doesn't have a site uh, here marked by this uh, blue dash uh, circle here. It's vacant. There's no site like there. So that means that it's not there. So the next triangle can be colored and satisfy the three coloring rule. And so the site is blue. 
again, this site here is vacant and it doesn't propagate this uh, constraint. And so now I can color the, the whole next row and uh, there's no problem. So one moves to the third row. Uh, again, uh, this site is, um, it can be uh, red or green. Uh, without boundary conditions, I've chosen blue. And now you see what happens for the Kagami lattice and the same physics will happen for the spin eyes. Uh, this site is blue, this site is blue, which means I have two choices here. The site that will bridge these two blue sites can be either red or green. And so I have two choices. And so here it's green. I have uh, these two sites here, are blue, and, um, blue and green. The next site is red. The next one has to be blue. The next one has to be red. And again, two choices. It can be blue or green. Blue, green, blue, green, red, green. Again, the next site, two choices. And so what you see is that whatever coloring pattern you've uh, introduced in the first row gets washed out completely by the time you get to the third row. And so this lattice is very, um, admits a, a very large number of ground state. And in fact, uh, um, there's an infinite number of ground states for uh, uh, this model, which one would call a, a three states plots model. On, on the Kagame lattice, it has an infinite number of ground states, so an extensive entropy. Um, and uh, also uh, another aspect that will show up for spin ice is that uh, there are low energy excitations in the system that uh, allows one to go from one classical ground state to the other by reversing the, the spin direction over closed loops. So for example, or uh, the, the black uh, line here that connects uh, um, blue and red uh, sites and which would be uh, closed for a system with periodic boundary conditions. If all the red and blue sites are flipped colors from uh, blue to red and red to blue, one stays in the in a ground state. So, uh, uh, so there's two, uh, there's, a, there's an infinite number of ground states and there are non-local uh, uh, moves or excitations at zero energy that takes uh, the, the system from one ground state to the other. And so this uh, physics for the, the Kagami system, Kagami and Typhoon magnet was recognized early on in the early 1990s and uh, something similar happens to spin ice. But the interesting uh, 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 thing about spin ice is that, uh, that that kind of physics is not only ha happening in the, in the model, it's actually realized experimentally. And this is why it has uh, um, attracted so much uh, attention. Okay, so, um, so for the experts, where does that physics comes from? Uh, one way to see that these uh, lattices with triangular, uh, shared, triangular shared units or shared tetrahedra units are so prone to have these degeneracy is if you do a mean field calculation and you calculate the staggered susceptibility, you find that actually there are modes which are uh, massless or go critical all at the same temperature over the whole Brinway zone. So there's no selection of a single ordering wave vector at the, at the mean field critical temperature. There's an extensive number of uh, massless mode at the phase transition. And in parallel, if you identify uh, candidate ground state for such system, and you do a spin wave expansion, for example, about the ground state, you find that there are uh, an, a finite number of uh, flat bands uh, over the whole Brillouin zone. So the system is extremely soft. Um, and so this softness of these uh, uh, extensive number of ground state is what drives the system to be extremely fragile and a, a good platform to look for exotic physics, including large quantum fluctuations. So that's the mindset that, uh, uh, that established the field of highly frustrated magnetism in the early 1990s. And, um, uh, and really working, it, it, it motivated the solid state physicists. I, I saw that you had uh, a talk from Bob Cava um, last year. And um, this kind of uh, mindset is what motivated solid state chemists and uh, people working in magnetism, frustrated magnetism, to look for materials which consist of uh, units, triangular uh, units that are connecting, connected by the corners or uh, tetrahedra connected by the corners. Okay, so these, uh, this, these architectures are realized in a variety of materials. 
uh, uh, crystalline structures, both for Kagami systems. Here I illustrate uh, a number of these compounds and um, also for lattices of uh, sharing tetrahedra, these arise in two major class of minerals, the power chlores with the chemical formula A2B2O7 and the spinels. And so in both of these very rich varieties of uh, minerals, uh, this uh, motif of uh, corner shared uh, tetrahedra is the essential feature where magnetism resides. Okay. So I want to focus on the power flow uh, structure, which is uh, this one here, uh, where you have uh, uh, the um, um, corner shared tetrahedra. Okay, so spin ice. So, um, so the, the power flow structures, uh, the oxide power flow structures is a very rich family of compounds. Um, and this is the general formula here, uh, R2M2O7. Um, there's a number of metallic such system, but the large majority are insulators. Um, and uh, you have two types of uh, ions, uh, cations. You have uh, uh, transition, sorry, you have uh, lantern, lanternide ions, the 4F series, such as uh, the gadolinium, terbium, and so on. Uh, these are uh, trivalent uh, cations. And you have uh, transition metal uh, ions uh, like uh, titanium, tin, germanium, and zirconium um, um, for the uh, M site. And, um, and then you have the oxygens. So what's really interesting about these compounds is that uh, uh, this uh, um, geometry, the, la the structure of uh, the lattice structure of corner shared tetrahedra is realized twice in these compounds. Uh, so this is a bit difficult to see on this picture, but if you squint a tiny bit, um, uh, the uh, trivalent rare earths, which are marked by the purple spheres here, form uh, through the blue bond, uh, a, a particle lattice of corner shared tetrahedra. So the, the, the rare earth ions sit on a particle lattice, but there is another particle lattice on which the tetravalent ions, um, the M ions here, also sit on uh, another particle lattice, which is uh, displaced uh, compared to the trivalent ions. And uh, the tetravalent ions, uh, the transition metal ions, uh, sit on, this, uh, on this, these green sites, which are connected by the yellow bonds. And um, most of the effort over the last uh, 20 years or so, of which the spin eyes belong to, has focused on systems for which the purple site is occupied by a magnetic ion and the green site is occupied by a non-magnetic ion. So for example, as a titanium four plus and tin four plus, which are uh, filled shells, they don't carry any magnetism. So, um, uh, so there's a, there's a large variety. There's literally thousands of these compounds, these uh, uh, A2B207 power chlores, um, and they, they have to satisfy some stability rules. Uh, it's not like you can have arbitrary combination of the trivalent uh, A site or B site. And uh, uh, so this, uh, this chart here illustrates a bit what's possible. So for example, if you look at uh, uh, the B site, what I referred to as the N site earlier, I apologize for the change of notation. Um, uh, if you have the, the transition metal site occupied by tin uh, SN here, then you can have for the rare earth sites, all the lanthanides are possible from the lutetium all the way to the, the lanthanum. So the, the heavy rare earth to the light rare earth. And so the, the, the tins are very interesting. All, all the compounds, all the rare earth power cores can be uh, realized. Uh, but uh, if you go, for example, to uh, titanium, then uh, you can only realize the uh, heavy rare earth because by the time you get to samarium here, uh, you, you, the, the stability ends and you can, for example, presidium titanate is not a particle structure. It's a distorted fluoride type structure. And so, um, um, so this is the, these are the constraints of the materials that can be synthesized where, uh, where the, uh, 
depending on what ion sits on the transition metal site, you can have access to different, uh, different, uh, different lanthanides or rare earths. So, um, so this, uh, this understanding uh, of what's possible in terms of the rare earths is something which uh, uh, was figured out in the early late 1980s and early 1990s. And um, uh, uh, people started then investigating these materials very uh, extensively. And this is where the discovery of spin ice came about. So focusing on um, the titanate, because these have been the ones that have been the most studied because they can be grown uh, in very large single crystal uh, using image furnace. Um, now I've got, I've got rid of this picture of the non-magnetic uh, titanium site, focusing on the, uh, the oxygens, which are marked by the red and the beige spheres and the rare earths, which are the, the blue, sorry, not the blue, the, the purple, sites connected by the blue sites. And so there are two types of oxygens and they play a very important role. So if you um, focus thing here, if you focus on, um, on one of the rare earth sites, what you see is that around that rare earth site, there is a distorted cube of oxygen. And um, uh, there's two types of oxygens that surround that uh, rare earth. Um, two of the oxygens reside very precisely uh, in the center of the, uh, the, uh, the two tetrahedra that are connected by the rare earth site. And perpendicular to the, uh, this axis that connects the two oxygen centered on these two tetrahedra is uh, a puckered hexagon, which is illustrated on the figure here. It's, uh, you have a displacement, essentially as if you took a, a regular cube with the oxygen and you, uh, you squished it, but kept the volume constant. So these, um, uh, these six oxygen uh, get puckered and uh, perpendicular to this uh, axis here, uh, you have an oxygen that is moved up an oxygen that is moved down and you have therefore um, an anisotropic environment around each of the rare earths. And uh, this uh, distortion is very large. Um, so to give you an, an, an idea, the distance from the rare earth to the, the red oxygen centered in the middle of the tetrahedra is about 2.2 angstrom, while, while the, um, the, uh, the distance from the rare earth to the six oxygens that are um, in the equatorial plane is about 2.5 angstrom, angstrom. So it's a highly distorted environment. And that distorted environment uh, is responsible for the anisotropy acting at the site of their, the rare earth. So depending on which rare earth, which lanthanide is occupying the lattice, you can have different forms of anisotropy, either uh, an Ising anisotropy or an, an XY anisotropy. So this is an illustration of what I, I mean. So if I focus on, uh, on, a, on a one tetrahedron unit uh, forming this, uh, this part or lattice, um, the, the anisotropy is such that the, the magnetic anisotropy, the magnetic moment likes to point along um, these, uh, these directions. So from one center to the other center of the tetrahedron, as indicated by this black arrow here. Uh, so uh, if this... Yes? Uh, uh, Michel, can I, can I ask, interrupt you ask a short question? In principle, uh, when people are uh, speaking about pyrochlor, sometimes they uh, really write formula like O6 uh, and O prime. So uh, sometimes pyrochlor has not O7, but O6. Yeah. So is, it, is this is just this uh, red oxygen uh, simply missing or what? No, no, this is, okay, so this is a, a good question. Uh, yeah, this, is, this has to do with an enlarged structure and, and referring to the crystal structure with respect to uh, uh, what's called a, a fluorite order structure. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different, uh, it, it, it's a, in the reference to um, a, a different uh, structure. The, the stoichiometry of the A2B207, um, as written by the chemical stoichiometry, um, in that, um, uh, that stoichiometry refers to a, 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 the situation where all the sites, all the oxygen sites that can be uh, crystallographically occupied in the particle structure are occupied. This 06, 06, 06 
um, an old prime structure um, refers to uh, a, a different crystallographic notation. And uh, I would not be able to tell you right now exactly uh, um, which, oxygen, to... which, which oxygens are missing in O6 from this one. Is it possible to say, for example, in the left picture, for example, if I have uh, six red, I keep, but for example, green, I uh, simply remove, put vectors. Would it be the uh, same as this uh, O6 structure? No, it would not. No, it's uh, the, 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 no, no, this, this notation, the O6, I know, I know what you're saying, this O6, um, O prime notation is consists for, in terms of the, 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 the particle structures that I'm talking about, all the oxygens that I'm re re referring to, are th those sites are occupied. It doesn't correspond to oxygen vacancies for that structure. Oh, I, I understand. In your, in your structure, in the uh, spin ice which you consider, you right. will always have O7. That I understand. I simply wanted to understand because people sometimes have this pyrochlor structure like cesium tungsten 2 or 6 or whatever. So right. I wanted to understand what is the relation. Which oxygen is missing really from normal pyrochlors, which makes it finally O6. Difficult to say right now. Yeah, It's not the same one. I simply thought that maybe that's actually this red one which is missing. Maybe one of the red ones. I, I, I do not know. Um... Maybe not. No, okay, very good. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting you. Go ahead. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, um, so depending of which ion resides on the um, on the uh, rare earth site, um, you can have uh, the magnetic, the local magnetic magnetic anisotropy can be either icing like, uh, making the spins pointing in or out of the tetrahedra, or xy like, a planar anisotropy. So now um, this is not like the Ising model or the XY model that you are perhaps familiar with, um, where the anisotropy direction is, is global, is the same for all the sites. Uh, the particle lattice has uh, um, uh, a different, um, is a non-Brave lattice. And so um, uh, each site on the tetrahedra as its, on the tetrahedron has its own anisotropy. So meaning that if you look at, uh, uh, the site here centered in the middle of the uh, oxygen cage that I've marked, it's Ising anisotropy, for example, goes from uh, the center of this tetrahedron here to this one, the next one to the right. So this would be, uh, this corresponds to um, the uh, one, one, one direction of the cubic, uh, the cubic lattice. The, the, these systems are cubic and uh, the, uh, the cubic cell, uh, the, the direction here that goes from this tetrahedron to this one is one of the four diagonals of the cube. So each of the sites on the tetrahedron has their own uh, trans, uh, privilege uh, anisotropy direction, which is one of the four di uh, diagonals of the cube, of the main cube. And so they, one refers to as a local anisotropy, which it can be either um, Ising-like, as marked by the, the red arrows on this picture, or XY-like. And so this is also another interesting aspect of these systems, depending of which ion you have, you either have access to uh, an Ising model or an XY model. And um, spin isers are, uh, are realized in the extreme Ising limit of holmium and dysprosium. And so, so where does that anisotropy come from uh, a, a bit for the experts here? Um, so if you consider the crystal field environment um, acting at the site of the rare earth. Um, this crystal field is such that um, it leads to energy levels um, for the ions, which are extremely uh, separated in energy wise. So holmium, um, according to Hans rules, has a total angular momentum of uh, J, which is given by the orbital angular momentum L and uh, the spin uh, um, quantum number S which is uh, um, uh, J equals uh, eight, uh, L is equal to six and S is equal to two for holmium. So J is equal to eight. So uh, holmium three plus, a uh, trivalent uh, three plus would have in absence of uh, crystal field effects, a 17 fold, a uh, two J plus one degenerate manifold. Um, but this crystal field environment, this oxygen, this highly distorted oxygen environment produce a very large crystal field 
at the site of the rare earth and lift the degeneracies of these uh, energy levels. And so what one finds is for holmium, the ground state is a, is a doublet, uh, is a doublet, and uh, the next excited state is also a doublet, and the energy, uh, the energy uh, difference or the energy gap between these two doublets in uh, un temperature units is about 300 Kelvin. And so there's a huge separation, separation of energy scale between the crystal field levels um, uh, of uh, holmium and dysprosium, um, which is much, much larger than the typical uh, energy scale defining the interactions between the, the rare earths, which is of the order of one Kelvin. So for all practical purposes, at, at low temperature where the system starts to develop magnetic uh, correlations, um, one can neglect the thermal population of all energy levels, all crystal field energy levels of these systems, except the ground crystal field doublet. And so these doublets have, uh, have uh, some uh, uh, properties, magnetic properties, which uh, confer to the system whether or not they have uh, Ising anisotropy or XY anisotropy. So, um, so I will come back to that later, but let me just say that for um, dysprosium and holmium, uh, the, uh, the, at below one Kelvin, the magnetic anisotropy um, or the magnetic response for a field that would be along the one, one, one direction, so along these, uh, these, um, these cubic direction, is of the order of 500 times larger than perpendicular. So these systems are among the most icing like uh, materials uh, that exist in nature. Um, the, uh, again, using language for the experts, the, the G tensor uh, or the, the G tensor that characterizes these systems in the a, a, a ESR type language, uh, the G tensor is such that it has two components and the, uh, the local Ising components of the G tensor below one Kelvin is uh, something like 500 to 1,000 times larger than the other components of the G tensor. So, they, uh, so we're, we're dealing with Ising systems um, uh, for holmium and dysprosium. Can I, can I also ask a question once again? Uh, yes. Dysprosium and holmium. Uh, yes. One of them has even number of electrons, another is odd. Yes, this is, yes. Yes. It's true that uh, then one uh, should, should have Kramer doublet and another non Kramer that, doublet? That, that, yes, that's a good question. Um, dysprosium is a, is a Kramer's ion and uh, J is 15 half, and holmium is a non Kramer's. Uh, it has uh, uh, J equals eight. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, uh, so the, yeah, so, I, 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 so Daniel, you're, you, you very much know about, all about this. So holmium has to have an Ising ground state because it's non-Kramers. Uh, dysprosium is a bit of a, uh, it's a, it's a, con a consequence of the, the point group symmetry here uh, mm -hmm. that it, this Kramers ion is Ising-like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so um, moving on. Um, so, um, so the discovery of spin ice was uh, uh, an accident, complete accident. Uh, uh, Steve Branwell and Mark Harris were investigating this uh, holmium titanate compound. Uh, they knew from magnetic measurements that it was at below one Kelvin, uh, that the holmium was very much uh, Ising-like in its response. Uh, but they also knew, knew from the uh, uh, magnetic measurements that the, uh, that the uh, QE vice temperature was about two Kelvin uh, with a, a positive sign, meaning that it is a ferromagnetic it is a ferromagnetic type interactions that is operating in this compound. But what they found through a, a number of measurements such as muon spin relaxation measurement, neutron scattering, uh, a magnetic measurement, uh, AC susceptibility measurements, they found no sign of phase transition in that system down to uh, 20 millikelvin. So this, this came to a surprise to them because you, you have a three dimensional system uh, the conventional unit cell is cubic, so it's, it's not an anisotropic system, it's, it, it's a cubic unit cell uh, for the conventional unit cell. The interactions are overall ferromagnetic. You have an Ising system for which there should be no quantum fluctuations. So it, the topics that I mentioned at the beginning that was motivating the study of these power flow is not operating here. So they would have been expected uh, 
to, to find a, a transition to long range order in a temperature scale of about one Kelvin or so. And uh, that's not what happened. And so, um, um, so this is some, what, what, the, um, what happened is quite interesting from the point of view of uh, science uh, in general. So it turns out that Bram, Steve Bramwell is a solid state chemist by training and Mark Harris is a, was a geologist. And uh, both chemists and geologists, uh, they know something that most physicists don't know. They know about water. And, uh, and so in the first paper on spin ice, um, this paper here, this FizRev letter, they immediately uh, explained what was going on and they were right. And so this is, uh, and this allowed the field to, to get, uh, to move rapidly from the beginning because they identify the essential physics of what's going on, uh, why the system doesn't order. And this is related to the little cartoon that I illustrated earlier for the Kagome system in terms of its co the coloring problem. Okay, so, um, um, so the, uh, the, the point is that uh, it's intuitively rather simple. Um, on, to construct a ground state, a minimum energy uh, configuration of the, the spins, the Ising spins on that lattice, um, one has to uh, satisfy a simple rule. Um, with the tendency that the, the spins must be uh, as aligned ferromagnetically as possible, given that the interactions are ferromagnetic-like, but the spins are Ising-like, that is, they must be pointing strictly in or out of the tetrahedra. Um, on a single tetrahedron, you have four sites. Uh, each spin can be in or out, which is two degrees of freedom. So on a single tetrahedron, you have two to the power four states, which is 16 states. And the minimum configuration on a tetrahedron is that uh, six of those 16 states um, satisfy the minimum energy configuration, which is two spins must be pointing in and two spins must be pointing out on each tetrahedron. And so, um, so this is illustrated here in the top right figure. If you look at, uh, uh, for example, uh, this, uh, the top left um, tetrahedron here, I hope you can see my mouse. You have the two bottom spins are pointing in and the two, the two top spins are pointing out. So this tetrahedron here has a local magnetization, which is along the plus Z cubic direction. And so uh, you have six such orientation of the magnetization. Either the magnetization on that tetrahedron is along the positive Z or the negative Z direction, and similarly for the X and Y direction. So, um, so if the tetrahedra were not connected, then uh, the number of tetrahedra in the system of N spins, you have N over four tetrahedra. So you would have six to the power N over four uh, uh, ground states. But these tetrahedra uh, are not independent. They are connected to each other. And so the bridging tetrahedron here that uh, intervenes between uh, the surrounding tetrahedra must also obey this two in, two out states. And so the, the, the hand-waving estimate of how many such states out of the 16, the bridging tetrahedra uh, satisfied this two in, two out rules is six out of 16. So this is a, an estimate. Um, this is an infinite series in calculating this number of ground states. This was done more recently by Rajiv Singh and Yan Oitma. Um, but the point is that uh, there is a, an extensive number of ground states that satisfies this two in, two out states. So it's, a, it's really a two coloring problem. In a sense, it's a, it's a simpler version than the Kagami one. On each tetrahedron, I must have um, two sites that are black and two sites that are white, essentially. And uh, this is the number of states. So the, um, uh, the entropy, which is the log of this number times the Boltzmann constant gives us this, uh, this extensive uh, zero temperature entropy given by uh, KB over two times log three half. And so, um, so this, um, this physics, uh, this number that shows up in this estimate 
And this physics of two in, two out is what was immediately understood by Bramwell and Harris as being the same physics as for water ice. Um, that's why the system got called spin ice. They are a magnetic realization of the extensive entropy of, uh, exact, uh, of common ice that I will explain in a second. So, um, so this, um, this number is well known in chemistry and in, uh, in statistical mechanics, it's called the Pauling entropy. Uh, Linus Pauling in 1935 um, computed the proton uh, entropy in common hexagonal ice, and he got this number. So, um, so the number of magnetic states in spin ice is the same number of states at this, the level of approximation that led to this result here as the number of ground state that exists for the proton coordination in common uh, water ice. And so that's why these systems are called spin ice. Okay, so what's the connection with, uh, with uh, water? and ice. So, so water is a very simple molecule, um, H2O, uh, but yet it has uh, over 14 phases uh, known depending on pressure and temperature. This is a, an illustration of all the phases that arise in, uh, in, uh, for water, and uh, they, um, they're all labeled by a, a Roman uh, numeral. Um, so the um, the common ice, the one below uh, zero degrees uh, Celsius, is called IH, uh, marked here. Uh, this is, uh, the H stands for hexagonal and I for ice. And so this is the, um, this is the crystal structure of, um, of hexagonal ice. The large spheres show the oxygen and the little spheres show the protons. And so, um, so the, the crystallographic structure or the uh, crystallographic stability of water ice, uh, the hexagonal ice, is due to the proton, uh, uh, the hydrogen bonding of the protons that bridge together the, the water molecules. And so, um, so in 1930, um, 1933, two chemists at Cam in Cambridge University uh, uh, announced what they identify or call the ice rules. What are the rules that the protons should obey in order to understand uh, ice as being a hydrogen bonded uh, crystal of water molecules? So these are well known in uh, chemistry or in the, in the science of water hydrogen bonding. Uh, it's, they are called the Bernal and Fowler ice rules, which are the two chemists that uh, enunciated those rules. So what are the rules? Uh, the first rule is for uh, between each oxygen, there can only be one proton. Uh, because if you have two protons on the same oxygen oxygen bond, you, you have too much electrostatic repulsion between the proton, and that will not lead to a ground state or a low energy configuration. So this cannot happen. The, the second rule, uh, the second Bernal Fowler ice rule, is that for each oxygen, there must be two protons that are close to this oxygen and two protons that are far, such that each molecule, each water molecule, H2O, preserves its uh, H2O molecular structure. And these individual water molecules ends up to be hydrogen bonded to the neighboring water molecules. And these rules are compatible with the fact that on the hexagonal, for the hexagonal structure of ice, each uh, oxygen has four neighboring oxygen. So this is illustrated here. So for example, if you look at um, uh, this uh, water molecule here, it has two protons that are close to it. And uh, these uh, two, um, um, these two, this water molecule with, with, with its two proton is bounded to this water molecule here through this weak hydrogen bond. Well, uh, this hydrogen bond here that is, um, that is illustrated by the dashed line here that goes from this oxygen here to this oxygen here. And so, um, so at the same time, uh, also in 1933, a chemist at uh, Berkeley was measuring the, the low temperature entropy of uh, various uh, simple gases like carbon dioxide, uh, vapor, carbon uh, monoxide, and so on. And, um, 
there's an interesting question of why was he and his group bothering with this question? So I, this is a different story. So, so what uh, uh, William Galk did, they started from the vapor phase of water, cooled down vapor down to the ice state, and through thermodynamic measurements, uh, measured the uh, um, entropy that was removed from the, uh, let's say, uh, room temperature, atmospheric pressure, all the way down to the lowest temperature, 77 Kelvin, that he was reaching. And through thermodynamic integration, measured how much entropy got removed. And to his surprise, uh, that entropy, that residual entropy was not zero. There was a residual entropy uh, left in the system. And so this is in, in disaccord with the third law of thermodynamics that uh, uh, a system should have zero entropy at zero temperature. And so um, two years later, uh, Linus Pauling um, uh, took these um, uh, Bernal Fowler ice rules, in particular the second one, and estimated how many uh, hydrogen bonding configurations are compatible with this hydrogen bond structure of water ice and estimated the number of ground state and uh, therefore the, 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 the residual entropy and he obtained um, this number here. So, uh, and this number agrees within 10% with the entropy, the residual entropy that Galt measured for water ice. So water ice is a phenomenal system actually. Uh, it's, it, the oxygen form a periodic crystalline structure which is hexagonal, but the protons themselves are not ordered. The protons do not form a periodic crystalline structure. So water is a kind of a hybrid between a crystalline structure and an amorphous state of matter, but it's not a glass. Be a glass would be have the proton configuration, which would be random. The protons are not random. They will be a very tight rule, which are uh, given with the very the tight rule being the second Bernal Fowler ice wall. So it's a very constrained type of amorphous structure. So um, and spin ice is uh, it has the same property. In fact, the analogy goes further. Um, so if you look at one oxygen here, one water molecule with its two proton, so this is what it would look like locally for the proton bonding in ice. Uh, this oxygen H2O here. Uh, looks like a water molecule, and it's hydrogen bonded bonded to these uh, two uh, water molecules here, which have their own um, red protons here. And so, um, so this uh, configuration for this water molecule satisfies the Bernal Fowler ice rule. And so, um, one can uh, represent that configuration by uh, vector displacement. So, um, we can uh, locate the bond, the center of the bond between two uh, neighboring oxygen and ask in what direction is the proton on that bond displaced? So for example, this proton here is displaced from the midpoint towards this oxygen. And so represented here by the green arrow. And so you see where I'm going with this. Uh, these two uh, uh, protons here are pointing towards this centered oxygen, whereas these two protons here are displaced with respect to the midpoint towards these two oxygen. And so the local configuration of protons near reference oxygens, uh, which are two protons near, two protons far, uh, maps directly into uh, two vectors pointing in and two vectors pointing out. And so these vectors pointing in and pointing out uh, in spin ice corresponds to the direction of the icing moments with the displacement of the protons being really discrete, either that much in one direction or the equivalent distance uh, towards the other protons. So there is in fact, at the nearest neighbor level description, the partition function for uh, water ice would be the same uh, for as spin ice. And so it's not only, uh, so there's a complete isomorphism in a sense between spin ice and water ice. Uh, the, the, the partition function in the thermodynamics is the same, and, uh, but also the, the spin directions and spin ice map, in a sense, the proton configuration uh, for water ice. And so um, that's why it's called spin ice. And it's also part of why it's uh, attracted so much interest. There's some subtlety here. Uh, spin ice is cubic. Um, uh, the conventional unit cell is cubic. Water ice is hexagonal. 
but at the level of the polling description of the residual entropy, that detail doesn't come in. They both have the same entropy. So this was uh, demonstrated by a famous experiment by Art Ramirez, Bob Cava, and co-worker in 1999 in a paper in Nature that has been enormously cited. And so what uh, these folks did is they measured, they followed the same thing that William Gark had done for water ice. Uh, they measured here the, uh, the magnetic specific heat for dysprosium titanate, one of these two materials which are candidate for spin ice. At these low temperature, uh, that's the nice part of this problem. Uh, they, one doesn't have to worry about phonon. Uh, the phonons are frozen out. And so one can measure the specific heat and through this uh, thermodynamic uh, identity here, or relationship rather, uh, by measuring uh, the specific heat between two temperatures, T1 and T2, one can integrate C over T and uh, calculate uh, the uh, entropy S that got removed between these two reference temperatures. And so um, this is what it looks like. Um, so at very large temperature, we know what the entropy should be. It should be log two. You have two, two states per site. And so at, inf at very large temperature, which means for all practical purposes above 10 Kelvin, the entropy should be uh, log two. And uh, uh, that fix one const the constant of integration at 10 Kelvin. And by integrating the area under this curve of C over T, one finds that the um, entropy goes down. And uh, here at low temperature, there's some difficulties in equilibrating that shows up. Um, but for all practical purposes, what one finds is that uh, going through the speed, the entropy is removed rapidly, and, but then doesn't go to zero in accord to the third law. It kind of plateaus around uh, this uh, value here, this blue, uh, and this blue line here, which is uh, uh, this Pauling entropy. And so in a conventional system that has an ordered ground state um, or a unique ground state rather, the entropy would go to zero as marked by the blue dotted curve here. But in, uh, in spin ice, um, that's not what happens. The entropy saturates at the Pauling va value within 10%. And so this, ex this kind of result has been uh, repeated over uh, the last 20 years over a, a number of materials. Um, as if you re remember, uh, I don't have to have titanium on the uh, B site. I can have tin, I can have germanium, I can have zirconium. And uh, in all these varieties, uh, by keeping the A site either holmium or dysprosium, the low temperature entropy is within five to 10% in the Pauling value. So this is the thermodynamic evidence that these systems are spin ices. Okay, so uh, where, does, how, where does that come from? How do we understand, uh, how do we understand that this system uh, obey uh, spin ice, the, spin, the ice rules. Um, there's a bit of a puzzle uh, and interesting physics behind this. So in the holmium and dysprosium titanate, the Curie of ice temperature is about one Kelvin, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the magnetic moment uh, at low temperature, uh, the magnetic moment for dysprosium and holmium is, is huge. Uh, it's about 10 Bohr magneton. And so if you estimate what is the dipolar energy scale uh, between two uh, nearest neighbor uh, on the sparkler lattice, you get an, a dipolar energy scale, which is also about one Kelvin. So these, uh, these systems, um, these, uh, ma these materials uh, are very uh, much governed, the thermodynamic properties is very much governed by the, the dipole-dipole interactions, magnetic dipole-dipole interaction not, uh, not, um, uh, it's, not a, it's not like transition metal ions where the dipoles are a very small perturbation to the, to the Hamiltonian. It's, a, it's the main part of the Hamiltonian. And so the first model that was put forward to try to explain the, what's going on in these materials is the one that's written in this green box here. It's, uh, it's called the dipolar spin ice model. It really has two terms. Um, uh, it's quite simple to explain. The, the last term, um, apart from the mathematical details here, it really just describes the physics of the long range uh, classical interaction between uh, Ising uh, dipole moments that point in and out of a tetrahedra. 
And so uh, the sigma i here are Ising variables. They just simply identify whether or not the spins are pointing in, out on site i. And this model is supplemented by uh, an, an adjustment, a nearest neighbor term, which is also Ising like, but it's a peculiar Ising term. It's not uh, the, the Ising direction again are these. Uh, these, uh, the, these diagonals of the cube, these vectors that pierce in and out of the tetrahedra. And so the, the Ising directions, which are denoted here by Zi, they point locally along the cubic 111 directions, the four of them. And so if you, um, if you combine these two terms together and you only calculate the, uh, uh, the dipole uh, interactions uh, at the nearest neighbor and combine them with the nearest neighbor, let's say, exchange-like term, you get a, an, an estimate of the nearest neighbor energy scale, which is given by this formula in the red box here, which is J over three plus five D over three. And these factors of uh, uh, one third and uh, the five, they just simply come, come from the, 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 the geometry of the lattice essentially. So this model is nice because a priori, the, the, the magnetic moment is known in these systems. So we know, and we know the lattice spacing. So the dipolar coupling constant D is known a priori before uh, it's, not a, a, it's not a fitting parameter in the system. Another way to say that um, the crystal field energy levels that I mentioned earlier, we know the wave functions from inelastic neutron scattering by doing crystal field analysis of those inelastic neutron scattering measurements. So we know the wave functions in the crystal field doublet. So we know what is the magnetic moment uh, that the, the doublet carries. And it's, it's 10 Bohr magneton, 9.9 .9 Bohr magneton. So D is uh, very well known. And so J here, this nearest neighbor coupling term is our only free fitting parameter. And so, um, uh, so we can uh, then try to fit the experiment and try to understand if this makes sense. Are the experiments in these compounds compatible with um, uh, these dipolar interactions? And so, um, so, uh, so again, the dipolar coupling constant is known. Uh, and so the only free parameter is J. And so we can go back to the experiment and look at the specific heat. And um, what one finds is that uh, there's the one key feature in the specific heat. It's the location of the peak and the height of the peak in the specific heat. So that gives us two quantities one can fit to extract one free parameter, which is J. So it's a, it's a very constrained, mo constrained model. And so, um, so this is what it looks like. Um, we can fit as a function of J over D, the, the location of the peak in the specific heat. This is this red curve here, or pretty much red, the straight line. And we can fit, we can calculate the peak uh, in the Monte Carlo simulation for that model by varying uh, the, 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 the nearest neighbor coupling J. And so what one finds is for dysprosium titanate, uh, the peak here uh, for C is about 2.4 joule per mole, per, sorry, 2.72 uh, joule per mole per Kelvin, and the peak is at 1.2 Kelvin. And these two quantities here, uh, uh, the, this value here for the peak at 2.72 and um, uh, the location of the, uh, the, the peak, uh, since we don't D, we know that the peak being at 1.2 Kelvin, we know what is the, uh, the value of the, the peak uh, temperature, the temperature at which the peak occurs. And these two quantities give us what's the value of J over D. And so we find that it's minus 0.5 or plus minus 5%. And since we know that the value of the dipole interactions, we know J by fitting either the peak and uh, of the, the specific heat or the location of the, the peak. And so this is what it looks like. Now, if you calculate the whole specific heat by fixing the value of J, uh, the red open symbols are the experiments and the blue data are the simulations, uh, the results from Monte Carlo simulations uh, where uh, we have adjusted the coupling J to match the peak. Uh, the curve as a the whole has not been fitted. So, um, so what this result shows, what this, uh, these data show is that uh, the physics of uh, the, thermodynamic, the, the, the thermodynamic properties of dysprosium titanate 
and uh, is described by this model. Um, and this can be confirmed by many, many more calculations, which I'm not going into to get into. But the, 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 the spin ice physics in this program titanate is governed by the dipolar interaction to a large extent. Um, uh, if uh, uh, the, the exchange term of the model, the nearest neighbor part of the interactions between the ice and viable is uh, in fact anti-formagnetic. And so this is uh, interestingly, there is a duality here going on. On this power claw lattice, if you have nearest neighbor anti-formagnetic interaction, given the ising nature of the spins, um, the minimum ground state energy configuration corresponds to not spin ice, but to a long range order structure. Um, so on a tetrahedron, on a tetrahedron here, if the interactions are anti-formagnetic, on a reference tetrahedron, all the spins would be pointing in or would be pointing out. But on the adjacent uh, tetrahedron, the spins take the opposite direction. So one tetrahedron is all spins in or all spins out, and the four neighboring tetrahedron have the spin reverse direction. So uh, the anti four magnetic interactions uh, on the power claw lattice for ising spins gives rise to. Uh, a, a two sub lattice nail ordered structure. So it's the, uh, there's a swapping uh, between uh, uh, the, the frustration arising um, between arising for fell magnet and anti fell magnet here on the power claw lattice when the ising uh, direction um, is, uh, is local. So, um, so the frustration in the system comes from the, uh, the dipolar interactions and, and they, they are, they correspond to they are the, the largest energy scale in the problem. So this creates a paradox that took a long time to resolve. These dipolar interactions are infinite range. They are not nearest neighbor. And so um, they, are, they have infinite range and there's many sub lattices that get involved as you go further and further from a given site. So it's a very complex interaction. It has a long range nature. And everything we, that I explained from the beginning of, of, beginning of the talk up to this point always involves the notion of simplicity of the Hamiltonian to allow uh, a large number of flex, a large flexibility to have a extensively degenerate ground states. So dipolar interactions just do not have that quality. They are extremely constraining on ground states. Yet uh, empirically, we, we found that uh, uh, this, this dipolar interaction explain the physics, 95% of the physics, if one can speak like that, of all these materials. And not only dysprosium titanate, but all dysprosium and holmium based spin ice, either with titanium, tin, germanium, or zirconium. So what's going on? Um, so I don't have the time to go into the, 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 loud, the, the details of that. Um, the problem is that once you go to low temperature and the system gets into uh, uh, a situation where at the nearest, uh, for nearest neighbor correlations, the ice walls, two spins pointing in and two spins pointing out uh, develop, uh, the system gets trapped into uh, uh, a, a manifold of very low energy uh, states, which obey the ice walls, but which are separated by uh, large energy buyers that cannot be activated by thermal fluctuation. Remember, these are, uh, there's no tunneling here going on. There's no quantum tunneling because uh, these spins are Ising-like. It's, it's, uh, these are classical system. All equilibration must proceed through thermal excitations. So one of the questions that we tried to address early on in our work was, how can we explore the low energy state of these systems? And so we did that by modifying the Monte Carlo algorithm and instead of trying to flip single spin flip, to do single spin flip in the Monte Carlo and go over these large energy buyers, we tried to do uh, what I illustrated earlier with the Kagame system to generate closed loops, which takes us from one ground state to the other, which if the interactions were nearest neighbor, these excitations, these loops would cost strictly zero energy. But now the interactions do not, are not nearest neighbor. They have these long range, dipole-dipole interaction. So these uh, 
these, these states, all these I states are not exactly degenerate. They have a slight difference of energy. And these are uh, these loops which flip, which flip spins on a closed uh, uh, racing track uh, allows us to explain, explore the low energy manifold of the system. So let me show you how that works with a, a cartoon. And so, so this is a, uh, as I said earlier, this is a, a, a spinized configuration. Each tetrahedron has two whites, uh, two spins pointing in, two spins pointing out. They obey the ice rules. And so what we do now, we flip that spin, we break the ice rule, but then we fix it immediately by um, flipping this side here and flipping this side here, fl flipping this one, flipping this one, flipping this one, and going around in a closed track this way, we end up flipping six pins and we return to an, a ground state that obeys the ice rules. This is the lowest excitation. I call it excitation because in the dipolar case, it's not a zero energy excitation. The small energy fluctuations between this configuration, they would be exactly degenerate for the nearest neighbor model, but they are not in the presence of the long range dipole dipole interaction. But by going from this low energy state and essentially bypassing the huge energy barrier that we would encounter by flipping single spin flip, we can very effectively explore the low energy state. And so, um, uh, and of course, these loops don't have to be only hexagons as illustrated here, but they can be spanning the whole system. And there's some interesting statistics having to do with loop spanning system and topological sectors, but I don't want to get in, into the, this uh, in this talk. And so this is what results from uh, the Monte Carlo simulations where we introduce these non-local moves in the simulations. Um, the open squares, that uh, are shown in the in this picture here, that the same results, they they, they they agree with the results I showed earlier. This is what you get from a, a, a standard Monte Carlo simulation running on a desktop over a few thousand Monte Carlo steps. And this is what agrees with the experiment. But if you introduce, uh, if you introduce these, uh, these non-local loop moves in the Monte Carlo, uh, some people refer to to them as worms. Um, what one finds is that at low temperature, uh, there is actually um, 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 a return to equilibration. Uh, the specific heat or the heat capacity start to, um, to, to take up again. And there's a transition to long range order where um, and the system develops long range order out of these extensively degenerate uh, ground states. So, so this is what happens, and this is how you should understand spin ice from a point of view of uh, uh, the dipolar spin ice from the point of view of an equilibrium problem. Um, so at high temperature, in the red region here called power magnetic, the system is a power magnet. It's a trivial power magnet. All the spins are uncorrelated with each other, and uh, it's as trivial power magnet as any power magnet is. Once you uh, cool down the system and you reach a temperature of the order of the curie vice temperature, uh, the system starts to develop uh, correlations, but without developing long range order. It's, uh, it crosses over from the trivial power magnet to a, a, a correlated state. Um, it's, a, it's really a classical spin liquid. There's no, there's no quantum mechanics here, but there's no long range order. It's a very constrained state where the spins at e on each tetrahedron must obey the two in, two out ice rule. So it's really a classical spin liquid. And the bump in the specific heat is a signature of a rapid drop of entropy where you go from 16 states per tetrahedron, essentially, to only six available that obey the ice rules. So it's a crossover from a power magnet to a, a spin liquid without a transition. But the spin liquid- Michel, is... uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, we already uh, have uh, quite a lot of time, but uh, on the other hand, actually, our standard Russian tradition to have long talks. So uh, I think that in principle, we can really uh, just uh, go on. I suspect that our uh, listener wouldn't object at all, but still just uh, maybe just keep in mind that still there are certain limits 
So okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So I can. But, I uh, can... but you, you have still a lot of interesting things. I, I like it very much. And I suppose that most of our uh, listeners also enjoy it. Very but much. I, I can stop here. So sorry. No, I no, 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 no. That's exactly what I wanted to say. That uh, let's make, for example, uh, say, for example, 10 to 15 minutes more. Is it okay? Sure. Sure. I can. I, 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 can think, that. I think that for us, uh, it would be more or less uh, like typical Russian seminars. Are usually not one. Well, this is but longer. I, 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 <laughs> there, there is some limitation in time, so keep it in mind. But okay, let's maybe make it maybe ten to fifteen minutes. Okay. Okay, I, I will. Yes, I, I can actually wrap up very soon now. So, no, 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 well, that's a pity if you wrap. <laughs> okay. Well, you. you can, I wanted to say. Okay, I have. I have lots of. Just think what uh, you think is uh, maybe uh, most important, most interesting, because otherwise. Uh, uh, you indeed have a lot of material, and uh, you know it, and I, one feels that you like it at all. <laughs> and you could probably speak for, for more than two hours, but that probably is too that's, already... that's fine. So I have a lot of Russian friends, and one of them told me yesterday uh, what is to shut up in Russian, but now I forget. So no, if, no, no. If, you, if you tell me in Russian, I will recognize the word, and I can just uh, stop talking. So, But it's okay. No, no. Okay, okay, let's so make let's, it, for let's, example, let's uh, 10 to 15 minutes, okay? Okay, sure. So um, so I, I really wanted to go slowly here such that I, I set the stage. No, that so was you, That was so you, 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 you get people who are interested, the, the graduate students, for example, can then yes. go and uh, pick it up. So uh, until, and, until now, it was really perfect. So I would have liked myself to listen even longer, but still... <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Not everyone uh, has uh, maybe enough time. Although I see that people are still here and nobody leaves. Uh, okay, yeah, but go, go ahead, but still maybe just... Uh, just okay, I will keep... Yes, thank you. 15, 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, Okay. so the story of uh, spin eyes from an equilibrium point of view should be understood as the following. This is, uh, this is clear, and everybody agrees on that. Um, in, for the model that I explained, there's three regimes. There's a, a, a PAM magnet, which is trivial. There's an intermediate low temperature state, which is a strongly correlated state of matter. It's classical. Um, it's very constrained. The dynamics should be extremely slow. And if equilibrium could be maintained, uh, there should be a transition to long range order below a temperature of about 100 millikelvin. Um, this, is, uh, this is agreed upon by uh, all theorists in the field. Um, the, but, um, and this, uh, this transition at uh, low temperature, this transition out of a signal by the peak in the specific heat, uh, it comes with a latent heat. There's a first order transition and the latent heat at the transition is very, very close. It's, it's illustrated here by the inset. Uh, it corresponds to Pauling's entropy. So all the Pauling entropy gets removed through this first order transition and the ground state is unique. So one doesn't need quantum mechanics to restore the third law. It does it on its own because all these states are not exactly degenerate. They have slight difference in energy, but um, uh, the, the system is somewhat frozen. So it's really, it's really like, uh, it's like, really like Kinedon maple syrup in Novosibirsk. It's, it's, really, it's really low, low dynamics, uh, uh, at low temperature, so it's a bit like a glass, but without disorder. What is, now, what is this? What is this uh, ground state? What is this ordering? What kind? Well, of it, right. So it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really you have magnetic field lines coming from these dipoles, and the system tries to eliminate the magnetic field energy as rapidly as it can over the unit cell, right? Still fulfilling the ice wall. So this is what it looks like here. You, uh, you have a set of tetrahedron which obey the two in, two out states on half the unit cell and the next half of the cubic unit cell, the spins are reversed. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a large unit cell uh, anti-fall magnet. Okay, so all this because of dipole-dipole? Yes, interaction yes, or... yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. It's all dipole-dipole. But the dipole-dipoles kind of get screened somehow by a very interesting physics which uh, uh, means that if you go back in the model and you refine the, the corrections, the model, not just nearest neighbor exchange, but you start to add second or third nearest neighbor, you can change that ground state. 
because it's very, it's the energy between these states is very finely balanced. And so, um, so this transition, um, this transition has, uh, has not been seen experimentally. Um, there's been many, many experiments spanning 20 years looking for this transition. This is one work that was reported already eight years ago um, where they found an, in their measurement uh, a specific heat actually disagreeing with a number of other experiments. Um, one can embark in discussing any and all of this work. I'm not going to do this. Um, um, so if you're interested, um, there's a paper from July this year by uh, many experts in the field. Some of you will recognize, uh, for example, Roderick Mosner, who's a terrorist at the Max Planck in Dresden, Alan Tennant, who's a neutron scatter, scatter at uh, Oak Ridge. And they, they look at this problem. How do they understand the failure of spin ice to order? And um, uh, okay, they have a story. Uh, I'm not sure I completely agree with their story, but the we, we don't understand really what's going on um, uh, in these systems um, and why they do not order. Uh, and of course, the role of stoichiometry, sample quality, inter-site disorder is always a concern. And so there's, uh, there's some open questions there that uh, worthwhile in, uh, investigating. Now, the title of this paper is Vacancy. Uh, there's a paper in Nature Materials in 2014, which is uh, Vacancy Defects and Monopole Dynamics. Okay, so. So this is, uh, what is this monopole dynamics? So that's a nice segue for something I, I want to alert you to, is that, uh, um, so uh, one way to understand uh, the, uh, uh, the spin ice uh, ground state is from the point of view of a field theory. And uh, the field theory corresponds to uh, implementing the ice rules by uh, a, a, a fictitious, let's say, electric field where, um, you have uh, chargers, uh, uh, chargers which are causing this electric field. And so the ice wall corresponds to um, a situation where uh, if you imagine that you discretize this emerging field uh, on the power flow sites where the spins are pointing, you can see that this tetrahedron here has two magnetic spins, two spins pointing in, two spins pointing out. So the, the lattice calculus, the vector calculus of, of uh, the, the field will tell you that this field is divergence free. There's as much magnetic flux going, the tet going, in, going in the tetrahedron as there is going out. So the spin eye state corresponds to a, a, a ground state where on each tetrahedron, there's no divergence of this uh, emerging field. But if you flip a spin as illustrated in the bottom, uh, picture here, where now you have, uh, it's an excitation, where you have now um, uh, three spins pointing out and one spin, spin pointing in, uh, you have a no longer a divergence free condition. So you have a, a source of this field and the neighboring tetrahedron now has three spins pointing in and one spin pointing out. So this is a sink of that electric field or of its flux. flux. And so, um, so the, the field theory description of this, the, the, the spin ice ground state um, is, uh, looks like a Gauss's law. It's so you have a, so the, the, the and these, uh, these, uh, these defects, these topological defects in the ground state of uh, spin ice, uh, these, these defects can diffuse around, they can move around. And, um, and uh, you have, for example, here, uh, tetrahedra, which, are, which have uh, these topological defects, which where the ice walls are violating and uh, the effective interaction between these chargers is Coulombic in nature. It's, uh, 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 this is a typo here, it should be one over R. So the, the, the monopoles, uh, which are sinks and source of the local magnetization interact with a, a Coulomb interaction, an effective Coulomb interaction. Um, so let me skip this. So this Coulomb interaction is a one over R between the defects, but instead of being one over uh, the charge, the electric charge square over four pi epsilon uh, epsilon, as in electrostatic, it's mu naught over four pi times uh, the magnetic charge associated to these dipoles. And so, um, and this magnetic charge is related to the dipole moment I mentioned earlier and uh, the lattice spacing. And so, um, so this is an, also an interesting perspective of the spin eyes is they, they, they are a, a realization 
of emerging field theory, uh, of a classical field, field theory. The low energy physics, the low, the low temperature physics of these systems uh, can be uh, described by uh, this kind of uh, Coulomb, this Coulomb physics. And so one can understand the spin ice physics in a different perspective. The power magnet is a plasma of those chargers in the uh, grand canonical ensemble. When you cool down the system, um, uh, you eliminate uh, 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 some, some of these chargers. Uh, the chargers are quantized. There's a sector of the chargers that get eliminated at low temperature. And when you go into the spin ice regime, you enter a vacuum where there's no charge. And so it's a, condens a condensation of, uh, of, the, uh, of these charges. Conversely, if you warm up uh, the system from the ice rule, it's, uh, you really have a, a, a crossover from a vacuum with no charge where you thermally start to populate the vacuum by having these, uh, these charges. Okay, so let me um, uh, finish with uh, uh, perhaps what is the current uh, interest in these systems. So I, I talked about um, uh, I talked about the system as being ising like and uh, being classical, and so you will you must be asking where's quantum mechanics gone, because uh, what I had to when I started with was angular momentum from holmium for holmium that was j equals eight. This is a very large angular momentum, and uh, you might think, well, uh, maybe. Uh, maybe there's no quantum mechanics is absent because I have large spin. That that is incorrect. This is what a large fraction of people in the field are saying. That is incorrect. Uh, the physics why the, the these systems are classical is that the crystal field of the system has separated in energy scale a low energy set of states for which the the Hamiltonian acting, the effective Hamilton acting at the low energy sector as no of diagonal matrix elements. It's like quantum mechanics got left at very large energy in the system. And for dysprosium and holmium, the wave functions that define that crystal field states in presence of the interactions that one expects in the system leaves no, no of diagonal matrix elements connecting the states of the ground state doublet. There's no quantum dynamics within the manifold of the low energy states. That's what it means that these systems are Ising-like. It's a um, quantum mechanics is the quantum fluctuations are quenched at high energy. That's for holmium and dysprosium, but that's not the case for the other rare earths. The other rare earths, for example, like terbium, uh, this, this gap of energy here is not 300 Kelvin, it's 20 Kelvin. And so there's some now, there's some mixing of the wave functions between the crystal field levels that brings back quantum fluctuations in some kind of perturbative manner. Um, and so, uh, so one can develop a theory using uh, effective Hamiltonian methods or uh, um, canonical perturbation theory to construct uh, an, a more, uh, an Hamiltonian, an effective Hamiltonian uh, for um, systems for which uh, um, the, the, the crystal field energy separation is not enormous, or even in the case where the wave functions in the crystal field states is more um, as, a, as a spectral decomposition, which is less Ising-like, I'm not going to go into the details here, less Ising-like than for holmium and dysprosium. And that happens, for example, for prasidinium. So, um, so what happens in, uh, in this case, um, um, let me, wrap this up, uh, what happens in, in these systems which are different than holmium and dysprosium, for example, uh, uh, terbium and prasinium, the effective theory that describes these systems is not an Ising model. It's what one would call an XXZ model uh, for the experts. It's a, it's, a, it's a model where you have a spin one half describing the, the degrees of freedom, but now uh, the Z components of the model still corresponds to, in a sense, the proton position in ice, but there are quantum terms in the effective model, which are responsible for the spins to tunnel, to flip quantum mechanically from an out direction to an in direction. And the proton language that corresponds to a proton tunneling, for example. And so it's believed 
that when these quantum tunneling events are sufficiently weak and sparse, uh, the original classical spin liquid of the nearest neighbor spin ice gets uh, transformed into a, a true quantum spin liquid uh, 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 that it would be described by uh, a, a field theory. And it is believed that that field theory is quantum electrodynamic. I illustrated that for the classical uh, case, the, 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 the field theory that describes the spin ice regime, the spin ice state, is an emerging classical electrostatic kind of uh, structure um, coming from the divergence free condition. So out of the Maxwell's equation, you only get one for classical spin ice. But once you in introduce the quantum tunneling, the spin flipping in the theory, then uh, it's believed that the effective field theory that describes uh, these quantum spin ice is, uh, is a theory which is, uh, uh, very closely related, if not identical, to quantum electrodynamics. Uh, so the, the quantum spin liquid state of, uh, of these materials, for example, illustrated here, uh, uh, written here, presidium zirconate, would be a, a genuine quantum spin liquid with very uh, exotic properties in terms of its excitations and its thermodynamics. Um, and this is a very active area of research. People are uh, exploring materials and construct and doing calculation to try to confirm whether or not the low temperature state and the low energy regime of these materials, uh, apart from holmium and dysprosium, are described by uh, uh, this kind of theory and whether or not the, the low temperature state is, is indeed a quantum spin liquid. Uh, the problem here is that uh, all that physics is pushed to millikelvin temperature, and this is, uh, this is causing some uh, experimental difficulty to to figure out the deep, what's going on. And so, um, okay, so let me uh, uh, wrap this up. So this is a story of spin ice. We start with a very complicated chemical uh, structure. Uh, we end up with a, uh, with a, a very simple, minimal um, magnetic model describing the statistical mechanics. It has relationship with another class of uh, uh, condensed matter states, uh, water ice in particular. Um, it, uh, it, is, it is a framework to study a, a field theory description of this system, both classically and uh, perhaps even quantum mechanically when uh, quantum fluctuations are present in other materials, but holmium and dysprosium based spin ice. Uh, and perhaps that field theory is uh, equivalent, it's very similar to what one calls quantum, quantum electrodynamics on the lattice. Okay, sorry for having taken so much time. So thank you very much for your attention.